So I wanted to start this off um, as my mother-in-law jumped into my car the other day and she didn't fasten her seatbelt because she was talking so much to me about what happened the last month in the family. I noticed that my car started beeping. So I was like, Maria, could you please put on your seatbelt? And she was like, yes, yes, of course, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then actually because she's an elder woman, I asked her, do you remember when seatbelts were actually put inside cars? Because growing up in the Netherlands, I remember our first Beetle Volkswagen did not have seatbelts. It just came with the Golf that came afterwards. And I remember playing with the button to understand how it would actually work. And so I looked it up because she started talking about this. And I'm wondering today if the GDPR is not maybe some kind of data crash test comparable to the seatbelt. Because when you think about it, you can draw parallels with it. And I know we're, we've been drawing parallels with data's big oil, we've been drawing parallels with fossil fuels and things like that, but I like the idea of the seatbelt because I remember when I was about four or five, my parents being stopped because we weren't wearing the seatbelt. So suddenly it was not only about legislation, which came about, for example, in the Netherlands in 1976, but also about it being enforced one way or another. And since then, we've evolved. I'm, I'm over 40 now, and my car beeps when you, know, you don't put your seatbelt on. So there are some interesting parallels with this. Also, if you look at it from an American perspective, seatbelt legislation is defined per state. That's strange. I've seen that in privacy as well, which is, which is interesting. So when all these, these things came about related to seatbelts, there was also an outcry, certainly in France, where they set up the points for your, your, your driving's license that you would lose three points if you did not put your seatbelts. I remember those outcries in the, the 80s and the 90s. So I think there's a lot of parallels to be drawn with seatbelts and the GDPR. Was there opposition related to, to the seatbelt? Oh yeah, there was, surely. So this idea that it would infringe individual liberties, and also this idea that it didn't take into consideration the risk for others, which kind of gets back to the idea also of group privacy that we heard about very interestingly this morning. So seatbelts for me are a bit, you know, what I, how I see the GDPR today. It's good. It's a first step. It's not perfect, but it's not supposed to be. There are still a lot of things that need to be discovered, need to be understood, need to be worked upon when we talk about the GDPR. So group privacy, where we heard about it before, a lot of discussion about competition, antitrust, a lot of discussion about fake news, freedom of expression, and a personal favorite of mine, which is this idea dear to the Americans about who owns the data, data property and where should we move from there. And then other issues as well, this idea of, okay, rising in inequalities, how do we measure GDP? Is that a good idea? Should we do something else with that? Ethics, democracy, so the, the digitalization of our societies is basically bringing about a lot of new discussions about what we should do with the data. So, for me, the GDPR is a baseline. It's a reintroduction of the fact that we as data subjects have something to say within the data ecosystem. So, on top of there is a graph of how all the articles within the GDPR link to one another. So, the GDPR is complicated. And I've been working on it for the last six years with my clients, and to be honest, Every, every day I still learn something more. New concepts I haven't thought about, situations of data I haven't addressed yet, but we can figure it out one way or another. And I think the idea is really to go back to this idea that data is the basis of trust, and we should build that for the, the good of all. Because we are all data subjects. This influences that, us all. And this is, for example, um, the logo of the Dutch Data Protection Authority, where it's interesting to see how they put everything together to create an individual. And this is the eco data ecosystem that we've basically created 
and that the GDPR is trying to address. So this idea that companies are either data controllers or data processors, there's a lot of things going on in between as well. They should appoint data protection officers under certain cases. Hopefully you've heard about how this works in certain articles. And then this is enforced by the supervisory authorities in each country supported by the European Data Protection Board. Related to that, what's interesting and in the reintroductions of rights for that data subjects like, like us is this idea that, well, I have a right to access to portability and things like that, which is basically the discussion of this conference here. So as such, I am a data subject, so are you, so is he, so is everybody. We're all data subjects, we're all actors within this ecosystem. And I would like to highlight as well that I'm always a bit tense about the fact that there's discussion about bad actors and good actors. I think we all work according to certain incentives, and related to that, we also have certain obligations. So where does that come from, this idea of data subjects? Well, there's kind of a basis that we know about. When I think about it, I always think about Eleanor Roosevelt, maybe because I'm a woman, so I'm kind of influenced by you know, big personalities. But if I think about data subjects, I think about the roles we have as data subjects. So my most important role besides what I do um, for work is this idea that I'm a parent. I'm a caretaker for my family and I have responsibility related to the data my kids use. So companies have responsibilities related to their customers and their consumers. It's about citizens. It's also about being a business partner, making choices about how the data is going to be used. There are examples of business ways of using data where you kind of do a risk analysis and say, well, it's actually not worth it. Let's walk away from this. And more and more companies are starting to think in those ways as well. Their responsibilities as data subject as employees. Me as an employee. I am a data scientist. I don't feel comfortable with what's going on. What can I do about that? is also something that needs to be addressed and is evolving slowly but surely. So we're all data subjects and we all have something to say about this. And it's not about us or them, it's about us working together related to these problems. So how does the Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 that was brought about after the Second War translated into European legislation? It's basically the Charter of Fundamental Rights which is the basis of our European values. I don't know if any of you have read it, but basically that's where all these rights inside the GDPR come from. So just to give some examples, <clears throat> Article 1 talks about human dignity, the fact that it's inviolable and must be respected. It talks about Article 48, for example, the presumption of innocence. And maybe some of you have been to the CDPD conference in Brussels um, that happens in January. And this is what their logo of this year, where basically they showed that algorithmically influencing the judgments of certain people in front of the courts is something that goes against the values of the European Union. So there are limits of data uses that for us as Europeans is possibly not acceptable because they are enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So I invite you to read it through and see maybe the link between what you see between the Charter and the GDPR. The thing is, as we're moving towards more digitalization of our societies, the question for a lot of actors is, is this a threat or an opportunity? Depending on the business model, they will see it one way or another, aligned with their incentives. So this is mainly for my big data science, big data plumbing friends. Um, they're always focused on this idea of speed. I need to scale, I need to speed, I need to go faster. There's more to life than speed. As I spent a month with my family and 10 hours in the car, I was happy to talk to my son and understand a lot of things from his life. 
Had I had a self-driving car, or had I had TV inside my car, there are a lot of things I wouldn't have known about my son. So taking it more slowly one way or another and think about the issues that are in front of us is something we should embrace and think about. Because in the end, it is about dignity, absolutely, it's about our rights, but also it's about this idea of autonomy, the fact that I can be myself, that if I talk about profiling groups and things like that, I am allowed to be an outlier. And that is something very dangerous inside big data because we're pushing everybody in the same direction. So being yourself and allowing for autonomy is something we should fight for as well. There has been a concept that has been set up to address this. So I'm part of the ethics advisory group of the EDPS. And this is a white paper that was written about two years ago about how we should improve the baseline set out by the GDPR. So this idea that we should have rules, we should have enforcements. So it will be interesting to see also how the supervisory authorities are going to evolve with the GDPR as well. We should have accountable controllers. So questions I get from some of my clients is, how do I prove I deleted the data? How can I show that I am accountable? Because accountability is very highly enshrined within the GDPR as well in Article 5, Paragraph 2, but how do I document all this? What is the best way of working? We should also have empowered individuals, people that understand what data is about and what the consequences are. And here again, teaching my kids not to take nude pictures of themselves, not having a camera in front of the TV, are things that are important but are my responsibility. It's not up to my school to do that, or it's a collaboration with the school. So I need to empower, we need to empower individuals for them to understand what's going on. And last but not least, well, innovative privacy engineering initiatives, like these kinds of conferences. What can we do next? Now that we have a baseline in place, how can we build on top of that? So as I said, <clears throat> I work for the, the European Data Protection Supervisors Ethics Advisory Group, and we have basically talked a lot about not going fast, not breaking things and failing fast, but using the adage festina lente, make haste slowly. Because we need to think about these things, we need to discuss how we are going to change our environment related to digitization. The thing is, what happened back in 2000 or 1990 with the internet, I don't know if some of you remember this one, the dog who said, well, you, they don't, don't know what, that you're a dog. We, Ten years later, the same cartoon came out and said, well, actually, now they actually know. And when I think about how data is being used, certainly the digital realm where, where I mainly work, when you make changes, there are a lot more consequences than the three or four little websites we used to measure. And this was the case also before. So when I started off, I have to confess, 15 years ago, I'm an econometrist, I love data, I'm a dataholic. Um, and I worked for companies. I installed Google Analytics on a thousand websites to measure, to make the business better. But the data wasn't integrated at the scale and the speed that it is today. So probably you've seen this from Cracked Labs. It shows the data commodification of our information and how it's being exchanged. I have worked for these companies as well who are asking questions about what should we do next? Companies like Axiom, for example, sent out warnings related to their SEC files a year and a half ago. They know that there's a problem. The question is, how are they going to face it? And will they face it in court or before is one of the main issues for a lot of actors in the data field. So some of you might remember this. <clears throat> when I started off, or about 10 years after I sold my first startup, The Economist came out with this idea of the data deluge. 
Recently, we're talking about data being the big oil or talking about the robber barons, comparing to what happened um, in the United States a couple of years ago, and this is where also this discussion about antitrust came about. So what do I do typically when it comes to my clients? Well, I look at what they propose to their, to their clients or their subjects, what is within their contracts, what do they promise, and then align this with what they actually do with the data. The problem is there's a big discrepancy between that. Lawyers write the privacy policies, the data scientists play with the data. There's not a lot of links between the two. It's coming because they understand that the GDPR will require it, but this was impossible two or three years ago. Yes, the GDPR is coming, don't worry about it. So a lot of companies are trying to figure out new ways of using data, one way or another. What I constantly bump up against, well, is this personal data threshold. It is personal data, it is not personal data. You are, you are obliged to do something about it. No, 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 IP addresses are not personal data, typically. So this is something that was highlighted as well in the, the previous session, this idea that, well, this, this difference between personal data and not personal data, this line is being blurred with time and probably is not the best way to think about it moving forward. Another issue that I see a lot is this idea of data ownership. Are we talking about the company being a controller? Are you a processor? Is it your data, my data, their data, shared data, third-party data, second-party data? There's a lot of that going around. And a lot of companies are trying to figure out what it actually means and where they stand in terms of responsibility, responsibilities. But it does mean that while we have a legislation, it's probably not ideal. So things need to evolve as well. But we will only do that if we start understanding the consequences of our, how our data is being used. So talking about it is personal data or not, this line is probably not the best way to think about it. But we are moving, I think, towards this idea of rights, roles, and responsibilities. Instead of talking about data ownership, talk about right of using data. Think about copyright legislation. Think about how this can can evolve one way or another. So a lot of businesses think about the GDPR, but they will do that in line with their incentives. So as I watch which companies are appointing DPOs or asking questions about the GDPR, not every company is the same. Your supermarket is not Facebook. And the, the influence that they have or how much gain they get from the data is very different. So it is interesting to ask if certain companies that are highly ambitious when it comes to data can actually talk about data ethics. Is it ethical and how do you define that one way or another? So what I think today when it comes to the GDPR is basically being compliant with the GDPR is about mitigating risk. It's about doing the baseline. I don't think it builds trust. I think there's still a lack between compliance and data ethics. There's like a gray zone, which will depend on the type of company you are and how you use the data. I would also like to add that I think with commoditization, the fact that a lot of products and services we buy today are basically the same, trust can become a differentiator. So, I would like to bring to you this idea that I don't think data is the new hour, oil, I think data is the new electricity. And it gets back to this idea of fossil fuels. Big data has been a bit like, you know, coal mining. It's not good. There are consequences, harms. And it took time. It took time to build solar energies. This is a picture of uh, a place in Castilla-La Mancha, where I passed through during the holidays, where basically I was amazed at how many solar panels there were and wind turbines and things like that. But this is because they were incentivized by the government. There were people that actually built the machines and thought about it. On the other hand, an interesting article came out about two weeks ago about a coal mine not being allowed to expand 
because they didn't take into consideration climate change. And this is the United States. So it's interesting to think about it when you think about privacy impact assessments, for example. Should we take into consideration the consequences for data subjects as well? It's not defined as such within the GDPR, and it would be difficult to do, but something we should definitely start thinking about. So what I would like to bring to you is this idea, data is a new electricity. I think privacy is a new green, but possibly not the only legislation out there, and that trust is the new currency. You will create loyal customers with this notion of trust as well. What do rights within GDPR look like? Because this is what we're going to talk about. The objective today, I'm not saying it's going to solve for the future, is to define and build access, portability, and things like that for data subjects because our values are enshrined within the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. This is the objective. This is what we need to do. And actors are actually doing that. So this is an example of Cloudera. Cloudera is a big data um, firm that basically does the, the plumbing, but they don't make money with the data. So it's up to them to define what kind of features they will put in front of their clients to make sure that they can, they can abide by their responsibilities. And I would even go as far as saying, hey, even Facebook thinks about how they could do better, whether they implement it or not, an ethics board is another question, but they thought about it, so there are bits and pieces out there. Other examples which I really like is this idea of data portability, public and private actors getting together to solve societal problems. It's about collaboration, and it's already going on one way or another. I think what we might need for that are certain forms of standards. So again, the GDPR is not perfect, but it's a baseline, we need to start with it, and then see how we can improve it. Are there other obligations? Yes, I think so. So my, my son came back about two months ago and said, you know, I understand why we have a library. I was like, oh, why? Well, because what's on the internet is not true. I was like, okay, so they had a discussion about fake news um, at school, which is interesting. So I really believe that there's like a collaboration that needs to take place between schools and, and parents one way or another. And this is a shameless plug for a good book. I think it's interesting. It's called the European Handbook for Teaching Privacy and Data Protection at Schools to make sure what we talked about earlier on, about this idea that your data is being stored and used for decades and that data from your grandchildren might also be used as well. Well, if we can start teaching our kids to make sure that they do the right thing, we can maybe limit certain risks that are out there. So what I basically want to say as well is it's important to assure autonomy. You can be different. You can be yourself and just continue the road to make sure that we build a better future. Thank you very much. <laughs>